Hey, practice owners. Uh, we're back again for another in our sort of pop-up series of interviews, Coming Back Stronger, uh, with um, uh, somebody who has done a lot in the industry, uh, practice, or uh, was a practicing dentist, um, uh, doesn't practice anymore. We'll uh, let him share that with you, sort of his story and his journey. But he has created a couple of companies, one, uh, Breakaway Seminars and Dental Whale, that have really taken sort of the dental industry by storm. And, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about the changes that we'll see in dentistry, and we'll share those during the interview. But right now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Scott Luna, and, and you're in San Antonio right now? Yeah, I'm in beautiful San Antonio in a huge office building, and I think I'm the only one here. So, <laughs> so to be aware of that, yeah, maybe kindred spirits in that. I'm, I look out the window, and mine is the only car in the parking lot. And, yep. you know, people say, well, can't you just sit up at home? And I can, but I, I need to, you know, I just need to go to the office. It's part of the routine. Makes yep. me feel a little bit normal in odd times. So, um, well, I, I'm thrilled to have you here. And uh, if you would, before we get started, take a couple minutes and really share with the uh, listeners and the viewers uh, kind of who you are, how you got here, and sort of what you're doing right now in the, in the world of dentistry. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a dentist. I graduated in 2005. I opened a startup practice right out of school, and we were seeing 350 new patients a month. Uh, soon after I opened the practice, I broke my back. And so I was not paralyzed, but I crushed the nerve roots going to my legs, and so I was in debilitating pain. So I was in and out of a wheelchair until I had a series of therapies and surgeries to correct it. And um, so I was in that wheelchair for about 12 years. Wow. Uh, it, it pushed me out of the chair. And so early on in my career, I had this booming startup. I grew it to uh, three locations, 10 associates, about 9 million in collections by the time I was a fourth year dentist. Uh, sold it, made millions, uh, took the millions, opened seven more, uh, lost millions, mm -hmm. and then I fixed them made millions again, sold it, and ultimately, uh, through all these ups and downs, I learned a tremendous amount of lessons the hard way. Uh, I eventually built a marketing company, a call center, a billing insurance company, a seminar company, and, and uh, today, um, our companies, I, I'm a, I have business partners as well, today our companies service 19,000 dental offices, um, and, you know, I think, my, my name is typically associated with teaching these intense business courses in dentistry through Breakaway Seminar. Uh, but I myself have owned Praxis personally. Our company has a partnership uh, type relationship with almost 100 practices. Um, you know, we'll answer more phone calls in one month than dentists will in 10 years and we have all the data behind it we know exactly what to say on the phone we know exactly what the narrative to, should say to fight a claim that wasn't paid we just have a lot of information and data and we, we've done startups we've done acquisitions and and I, I just feel like um there's a lot that dentists can learn from us the types of lessons i wish i could have learned uh the easier way um when i was making and losing millions of dollars and that's, that's yeah, that, that's really why, and that's Dental Whale, right? Dental Whale is the sort of a collection of companies that are service providers to, to practice owners, right? That's correct. Yeah, there's, uh, I, last I counted, there are 15 or 16 different kind of companies within the Dental Whale organization. Um, and, uh, but, but again, my name is typically associated with Breakaway Seminar. That's how people meet me and, and uh, I, I teach these courses for for dentists. Um, I, I am no longer in a wheelchair. I could be a dentist if, if, I, um, if I chose to be. Uh, but to be honest with you, I've got five kids. Um, my youngest isn't even two yet. Um, and I've got, we've got 850 employees or so uh, at our company. Um, and so I, I, I fill my time with a lot of different things and I, I choose not to practice today. That, that might change later, but today I, I do not practice dentistry anymore. And, and I think that is, that's valuable. Um, first of all, you know, we, we talked earlier about uh, understanding um, the dentist mindset, 
And, you know, it's one of the things I speak on is, you know, not being a dentist. It took me a few years to figure this out. You know, there's a dentist mindset and then there's a practice owner mindset. And one of them, you know, when you're seeing patients, that dentist mindset helps you. You know, you spent four years, you, and you have a lot of CE, though, all the, the clinical things that you love to do and lay awake at night, getting excited about, you know, the implant case tomorrow or all those things are great. And in a time when you can hand that off to your, your uh, practice manager, your office manager and say, oh, here, I got this thing about taxes, you know, whatever this is, take care of it. Uh, that's great. That works wonderful. But in today's time, you know, sort of to focus in on the, I don't know, whatever we call it, uh, business, uh, you know, I've been in business a long time. I've never seen anything like this. Um, business disruption or business entire shutdown. Uh, you know, it's tough for a guy like me who went to Indiana University School of Business and has all the education for it. It's, it's I don't even know, a thousand times harder for somebody who just wants to see patients. But suddenly they've got to figure all these things out. So what, um, and I think what's interesting about what you do is in a, you know, you hear a lot of uh, 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 group practices come in and say, well, we buy up a lot of dentists. You sort of, you have some ownership in practices, but you really are a support organization for a lot of sole practitioners. Is that, is that kind of how it works? Yes. I mean, we, we basically elevate the private dentist to the same level as the largest DSOs. The, the prices they pay for supplies, the call center support they have, the marketing support they have, even, even down to architecture and design, construction management, we give them the infrastructure. They, we let them rent the mega infrastructure that is similar to those of the largest DSOs. So they are on an equal footing now as those large companies. Um, that is what we do. Almost every dentist we help is a private dentist. Yes, we, we, we have partnered with some of them, uh, but there's a, that's the smallest part of a company actually is, is partnering with practices. Almost everything we do is helping support practices on a, on a monthly basis. Uh, but you know, dentists, dentists are changing. Dentists used to be clinicians, almost solely clinicians, and, and our society and the economy supported that. Um, and over time, we've all felt, Dennis, we've all felt the pressure to understand the business principles better and to make strategic moves and decisions in business that are optimizing kind of our, our success. And that has now become, become one of the primary drivers of today, right, in this environment, uh, how we think about it and the strategy we use today and coming out of this is going to have a huge impact on our financial stability and the, the health of our practice. And so whether or not we like to think about the business side, uh, we have no choice. And, and the good news is, is that small things can make big changes, right? Like, like, like the, the, the saying, a small hinge can swing a big door. Right, these small changes, just like if I'm prepping a crown, if I can just make a small change to smooth that margin, it changes everything about the crown in a good way. In the business side, there, there are these handful of things that if we can just address those and, and tweak them the right way, we see a huge result from it. And that's where a dentist should start. Let's get the foundational things correct today so that we can come out of this thing and, and be successful as possible. Not, and not everyone's going to come out of this. Right, right. We're going to have a lot of patients, <laughs> a lot of displaced patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, you know, that's something that a lot of practice owners, they just don't want to hear. You know, they, um, they have this. And, I, and so maybe back up for a second. One of the things you said is, is I've always been interested. I've had this conversation uh, many times. And again, I speak on that, the, the, the sort of the wall in that mindset. And I see it in my emails and my text and my social media messages and people and phone calls. And, you know, you go to dental school and you come out with a protocol. There's a step one, two, three, four, and five, and this is the best one. And you follow the, the Dr. Jones method, and it is exactly this. And you can find comfort in that. And maybe you can, you know, give me your opinion on this. In business, you don't have that. 
the best way to do something is the way you as the, the owner might decide to do it. Now somebody right next door might have the same business, do it completely different, and it works for both of you. And that's kind of the neat part of business, but it's also the scary part if you're not inclined to say, you know, this is, the, I've, I've thought about it, I'm ready to make a decision, I pull the trigger and I move forward. It seems to me that, you know, my calls and emails have this desperation and they always say, uh, what, what should I do? What's the best way to do this? I had, I had an email the other day, man, it had to be two pages long with all kinds of supporting information and research. And I watched this on CNN and all this. And at the very end, it said, what should I do? Now, I look at that and think, well, gee, you should make a decision. That's what you should do. But I think that dentist mindset struggles with that. So do you feel that with the, the practice owners that come to you that they just need somebody to say, do this, and you know they're happy to go back seeing patients? Yeah, I, I mean, yes, uh, but there's a lot of types of dentists, right? So you know, on one hand, you've got the dentist you just described. On the other hand, you've got the dentists that see themselves as entrepreneurs first. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that making a decision is better than not making a decision. And that's where a whole lot of dentists get trapped with these engineers that want to weigh all the options and ask their colleagues and, and we're paralyzed in making a decision. But I also believe that one thing you said, there's a lot of different ways to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, just like I, I could be successful placing only implants or I could be successful doing a general dentistry, right? There's a lot of different ways to do it. There's not a best way, but there are things considered best practices. So best practices might be the most proven way to answer the phone. What's the best practice in managing insurance claims, right? Um, and so, so there's for sure truths. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, just like dentistry isn't simple, there, in any given procedure, there's 10 or 20 factors that we're, we're processing at the same time. Business is the same way. Um, so, you know, coming out of this thing, a whole lot of dentists need to start with the basics. What brings in revenue or collections and what takes the collections out of my pocket, right? Like we need to think in the basic way and get those things right. Um, as opposed to focusing on the noise, the noise of, of political decisions and laws and the noise of my team member this and my patient that. Let's get the foundation correct there's going to be so much opportunity coming out of this for those dentists that just do the simple things well. So the ones who, um, you understand that, and again, we're in about, we're week four, I think. Um, so for somebody who's watching this and, and binge watching the right thing, you know, they're binge watching how to improve their practice when it starts to loosen up. They're trying to build a little, a strategy of, you know, do, I, do we come back instantly? Do we ramp back up? How does all this work? And they are doing the right thing. You know, they're not binge watching, um, you know, Game of Thrones and trying to catch up on, you know, 10 years of The Office or whatever. They're, they're focusing on their practice. What are a couple things that you see from your business and your experience that they can do today or need to do today to number one, stabilize their practice? While all this is swirling around them, what are, what are some really positive tactical things they can, they can do right now? No investment. They don't have to go out and buy anything. They don't have to leave the, uh, the office or the house. What can they start doing today to stabilize that practice to, to get ready for coming back? Yeah, I'll, I'll list a bunch of things. Okay. Uh, so first of all, we have to understand that when we come back, <laughs> patients are going to be displaced. They don't know who's open, who's not. They don't know. Uh, I mean, there's going to be dental offices that don't even come back and open. They, they may have lost their jobs. They may have got a new job. They have new insurance. They are not going to feel like they have a home. We have to counteract that trend in our practice by having continuous uh, touch points with them now. So I'm talking about existing patients. Right. We need to be social with them. We need to show them pictures of us in quarantine with our family uh, on social media. We need to be sending them updates via email. And if their profi was canceled because we're not open, we need to reappoint that profi immediately for three months later and let them know the new time and date. We can't let them fall out of our software, right? So we have to have a strategy. 
If we're open today seeing emergencies, we must constantly communicate that digitally, not just, of course, to the existing patients, but also from a marketing standpoint. Google Ads right now is working very well for the practices that are open for emergencies only. So we have to have a strategy today to start on addressing the patient flow, the existing patients and potential new patients. We also have to have a strategy today on um, managing our collections and our phones. Chances are the offices watching this are either closed or heavily shrunk down, furloughed employees, laid off employees, and there's no way these offices can answer five calls at once. Right. And they may not be managing their collections well right now. They may not, no one may be resubmitting claims and fighting to bring that money in. So this is the prime time to have virtual schedulers and virtual insurance and billing companies be taking over this volume and cleaning everything up and managing it. For a tiny cost, a practice could have 92 hours a week of phone coverage and answer 10 phones at once and have patients scheduled in real time in the practice software custom to the practice. Like now's the time to do it. It's more affordable for the business than hiring a person and it's way more productive. And coming out of this thing, there might be a swell of demand and missed calls are all, they already were a problem in dentistry. About a third of new patient calls were never even answered. Mm -hmm. It was already a problem, but when there's a swell, it's going to get worse. Um, when it comes to billing and insurance, utilizing virtual um, companies to clean up the claims and fight those unpaid claims makes complete sense right now because we need the collections to come in. We can't have that drip down to nothing. So, you know, there's, there's several companies that do this. I, I have one of them. Our company's Front Desk DDS. Front Desk DDS. We do phones, billing, and insurance. I think we're one of the largest. There's other companies too. But now's the time to engage in that. It's a fraction of the cost of a person. It cleans everything up. So, so phones, billing, and insurance, existing patient communication, new patient communication marketing but what about the dentist and what about the team okay and what about the business and so if the team is still employed now's the time to have them get virtual training go into a company like front office rocks and and for a tiny cost every month they can have unlimited training online or for the dentist training that they can go to front office rocks I know that our seminars are about to go digital, literally within weeks of, of this recording. You know, our intense business training is now being moved digital. It has to be. We have to help dentists that can't travel to San Antonio. Um, also, if we think about this, you know, besides training, there are uh, clinical training courses that can be taken virtually. And if a dentist can learn a new procedure, then for the rest of their career, they diagnose more dentistry. For the rest of their career, they become more productive. For example, fixing a crossbite on an eight-year-old kid with a simple retainer, a simple Holly appliance, is something you can learn virtually. It's so easy to do, and for the rest of their career, they diagnose more dentistry. Or, now's the time to clean up the business systems. I'll tell you what's happened is our consulting programs, these kind of mega year-long programs have turned into hourly rate hire consultant because a practice can't use a year program right now, but what they do want to do is clean up their business while they can, they're the most important things, and they're hiring our consultants per hour um, so that they can just focus on special projects that need to be done, like cleaning up the payment options form and, and, and the process for case acceptance or getting hygiene to be more productive. These are the things that should be done right now. Yes, they all cost a little bit of money, but spending a little bit of money right now gives you a career of success. And if you wait until you're open and slammed, you're probably not gonna put the time aside to do it when you have the money. So I think you could be smart and strategic when there's excess time and a little bit of money, do these things that are gonna create success for the remainder of your career. And those are just the things to do now. You know, 
That doesn't even include the things that we're going to have to be thinking about once we're open. Because life's going to look much different, I think, for a whole lot of us dentists when we're open. Well, what do you think? Uh, you're spot on. I think um, a lot of dentists, again, we were talking about, they can spend their time binge watching Game of Thrones or they can spend their time binge watching something, a skill they own. Um, you know, once you, once you learn how to do that treatment, you own it. You own it forever. And uh, it may turn into something you love. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of practices doing more, integrating more health care or health um, procedures into their practice. And it turns out they love it. They love the patients. It comes through in their enthusiasm. But yeah, these are things you can do now when with eight hours a day um, to sort of tactically get a handle on stabilizing your business. The other thing you said, I think, is also right on, you know, as a business person, you look at your AR and say, you know, that's money that I'm owed for work that I've done. I just have to find a way to get it in. And with um, insurance companies, you know, they're not, they're not holding that payment because, um, <clears throat> excuse me, because they're not working right now because they don't have a paycheck. They're withholding it for some kind of a clerical issue or, you know, a narrative isn't exactly the way they want it or it's not coded exactly the way they want. They're not going to volunteer that. They're not going to call you and say, hey, if you just change these numbers, or if you just add this phrase, you know, we'll get you a check out. You've got to reach out to them. So, um, yeah, I think I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, so if we do those things and we stabilize the business, sort of step back in bigger picture when we come back, a way to come back stronger and a way to, to because I, I think you and I agree, this, there are a lot of practices that won't exist after, you know, June of this year or, um, there are a lot of practices that are shutting down now. Um, they just, they can't, they can't make it and they can't foresee making it. So there's a sea change in practice ownership, we'll call it. Um, so if you are committed to being a practice owner, um, what are some things you should really be doing now in addition to what you just listed that are sort of bigger picture, longer term when, you know, and nobody has a crystal ball, but you know, there are some things you can kind of figure out long term to lay that foundation for coming back stronger when you know the engine finally does start up yeah there, there's there's a couple things okay. um and, and before i go through those couple things let me tell you that it is going to be an amazing time to do a startup and to acquire practices coming out of this so we probably have uh, if i had to guess i'd say like a good year year and a half maybe of startup opportunities everywhere from all of these displaced patients and this kind of shakedown that we're all being forced into with this. Uh, but yeah, so coming out of this, one, one thing we have to recognize is that patients are not going to be financially as strong as they used to be. Um, too many people have been laid off and furloughed. Um, so when we think about our payment options in a dental practice, we need not just a payment option for people with money, not just a payment option for people that have good credit, but specifically we need to find the payment option for people without money and poor credit. Mm -hmm. And that is where a whole lot of opportunity exists. And I, you know, what I've seen, I've seen a lot of dentists um, shun these patients in a way. Uh, not, not that they mean to, but their practice policies just don't allow these patients to get it done. But these are great patients. They need work. They want to get it done. And if we can just have a payment plan that fits for them, then we get to do it. But these are high-risk patients, right? So what do banks do with high-risk patients? They charge more fees. They charge more interest. We need a payment policy for them. Now's the time to set that up. I'll list a few companies that have it. The company we use the most is called Benefits. Um, another company is called Clear Gauge. Also, Comprehensive Finance, uh, Viridi, V-I-R-I-D-I, -I, Viridi. Those are companies that have an option for this type of patient. They're, none of them are the same. But like for Benefits, for example, I can put a patient on a payment plan, and whether the patient pays or not, I always get paid by Benefits. It's guaranteed. So I don't, as a practice, I don't have any risk. Benefits makes money on this because they charge enough fees to outweigh their defaults. But if I have this as a tool coming out of this crisis, these patients 
that are struggling financially can now get a lot of their work done because I've got a way to give them a monthly payment that does not put risk on my practice. So, so that's an example how we might tweak things because of this. Another thing that might occur coming out of this is that if we have displaced patients and we market well, we will hopefully get a swell of demand in our practice. Mm -hmm. And we have, to, we, have to have this, we have to have a strategy to create the swell and to manage the swell. So how do we create the swell? That is gonna be working out our entire marketing plan right now and just not pulling the trigger until we can be open. But the marketing plan is gonna be likely heavily digital. Uh, we may, may have some direct mail components to it, but that marketing plan is, may involve updating the, the website, updating the social media presence, setting up funnels on social media, um, having different landing pages. All of those strategies are gonna be more successful coming out of this than they ever have been because all these other practices that used to compete with us for those marketing eyeballs are probably not going to be competing as hard. So we are going to be able to, to get a lot of eyeballs from our marketing. Now, you know, I, I say this not because I wish other practices uh, to be hurt or be unsuccessful, or I don't want anyone to be in a bad situation, but the facts are that they are. Right? The facts are that some aren't coming back. The facts are that some aren't marketing. And so those are the facts. And now when we look at ourselves and say, okay, what can we do to come back to where we used to be? Or maybe even better, marketing is going to be a big deal. There's going to be a window of opportunity where the first to market well are going to have a really good return on that investment, which will hopefully create a swell uh, of demand. And we, my opinion, as dentists, that swell is not going to be permanent. So that means we must expand our hours and expand our chair time temporarily to allow the swell to occur to help lift us up. Just like a restaurant might get a swell of, of customers during lunch, they open the patio, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to get a swell of customers right out, out after we market, after COVID, we're going to open up more hours. And, you know, we may be working 40 or 50 hours. I know we didn't sign up for that, but we got to do that in the beginning to stabilize this practice and to kind of jump up to that rung we used to be at. And then it'll go back down and we'll normalize. Uh, but just because we hope for the swell doesn't mean we come out of this open 50 hours a week. We, we have to be very careful and fast at adjusting our capacity to the demand. We don't want to be overstaffed for 50 hours a week when we only have 30 hours of demand. So we have to, uh, we have to ramp up to the swell, but we have to ask ourselves every day, do we need to expand now? Yes or no? So, so it's going to, for some of us, it'll be a very slow expansion. And for others, it'll be very fast. But what we should not do is overexpand because we don't have the ability to take on additional financial risk for the hope we're going to be busy. We, the most money businesses make, the most money businesses make is when they are stretched right before they expand. That's actually the sweet spot. When you can feel the stress and you can feel the vibration in the company, you're doing the most you can with the cost you have is when you make the most money. And the minute you expand your costs to do more, you make actually the least money. Mm -hmm. So we need to be very careful to maintain it to where we're feeling a little bit stretched, but we are not overstaffed and we're not overspending. That's the healthiest way, I think, to manage this swell that hopefully happens from great marketing coming out of this crisis. So you keep that, um, and I think you're, you're spot on. You said several interesting things is, that I think a practice owner watching this is going to be inclined to say, okay, we got, you know, I don't know what it looks like. You know, we've never been here, but we get a notice, you know, on CNN or Fox news and it says, okay, we're back in business. And suddenly you, your, your tendency is awesome. Let's bring everybody back. Let's get it started. Let's, you know, we're, we're back on Monday and your whole team shows up and your schedule's half filled and you feel, and you got a PPP loan that, you know, you're burning through and hopefully, you know, your timing meets up and all that kind of junk. 
but suddenly you you realize you've got a bunch of staff standing around and i think that's where that that challenge comes in so in laying that groundwork or sort of looking down the road is there any advice you can give somebody you know for example i mean you know if i'm looking at a particular business and my my revenue's off 50 percent you know my cost which is primarily people needs to be off 50 percent i can't be paying 100 percent of you know i can't be having a profit margin of i don't know 10 percent uh normally my business my income's off 50 and my costs are the same i'm just losing a bunch of money right now that i don't have at the tail end of you know, struggling to stay alive. So any, um, you know, again, as a being a practice owner yourself and a doc, those are difficult decisions for solo practice owners to have, to decide who works and who doesn't work. Um, and so in sort of getting ready for that, to have those conversations, any advice you can share, you know, when it comes to saying, all right, it looks like we're going to ramp up, which means you know, where we've got, you know, a quarter of the schedule filled for the next two days. And it looks like starting next week, we're half full and, you know, we've got some patients coming back. Any advice on dealing with that as a, you know, somebody who went to dental school and trying to figure that out? Yeah, we should be staffed at the lowest rate that allows us to continue to treat the patients trying to come in. So a skeleton staff or a bare minimum. Lean, let's call it lean. Okay. Um, we do not staff ahead hoping to grow into it. We just can't do that. When we make those mistakes and we spend more money, we are spending our family's money, our children's money, mm -hmm. our own stability from that mistake. This is a time where we have to have discipline and we have to stay staffed small. And as we grow, we slowly add cost. We cannot jump to cost first. The growth must happen first. That means we're gonna stretch. But we can't just bring everyone back on day one, we can't. And we may never bring everyone back. We may come out of this and never get to the size we were, or we may get to the size we were, but we realize, you know what? We're better now, we don't need that extra person anymore. They were, we were kind of overstaffed back then. And that's healthy. That's like the forest that has a fire and it grows back stronger, right? That's healthy. What we have to do is we have to just say, look, everyone in my company, every one of them has been laid off because of this crisis. And that's the way it is. And moving forward, life is different. My practice is not the same practice anymore. I'm literally starting over. And if I'm starting over, how many people do I need today? And that's how we have to do it. We cannot have this mindset that says I need to bring everyone back. We can't because that is a financial mistake that can burden us and hurt us and erode away our stability over time. And I know it's emotionally tough. It is, it's emotionally tough, but that's what we sign up for when we're practice owners. If we, won't, if we don't, don't want it to be emotionally tough, let's just go work for someone, right? But if we sign up as a practice owner, we can't, we're not just a dentist, we're a CEO as well. And we must look out for the well-being of our company. We must do it. So it's difficult, but we have to do it that way. The smart thing is to bring back the least amount of people that get the job done. And slowly, as the swell happens and you've proven that you need someone else, then bring someone else in. Now, utilizing outsourcing also changes this. Because as you grow, if you outsource your billing and insurance and you outsource your phones, as you grow, you're not hiring anyone extra, right? And if you were to grow and then shrink, your bill goes up and then down, right? Like, like you're not stuck with this higher, this permanent payroll expense that you can't like cut down 20%. See, outsourcing gives a ton of financial flexibility to the practice. So this is a great moment to really look at outsourcing as a model or as a strategy in coming out of this. You as a dentist could have just the small core team of your very best people. And as you start to grow more, all that front office excess work is just picked up fractionally by an outsourcing firm. You don't have to go commit to a full payroll and another full payroll. That can go up and down with fractional outsourcing. So I, I think that's just an excellent strategy. But I guess my take home message is do the right thing for the business, 
not the right thing for Joanne, right? You've got to protect the company, not necessarily a single person. You have to do what's best for the company so that all the other people that rely on this company are in the best situation they can be in. So it's sort of the, the um, oxygen mask theory. You know, if the, you're on the plane and the oxygen mask drops down, take care of you, the business, and then you can take care of other people. But if you're trying to take care of Joanne, you know, she might be taken care of, but suddenly, you know, there's no money for payroll and, you know, you're out of business. That's um, the other thing that, that jumped out at me is maybe you're, um, and you'd said this a while ago, you know, there are going to be a lot of startups. You know, a startup doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, from zero. Um, it, that, you know, a startup strategy is just that. A startup strategy is, okay, I'm going to start my business. How would I people that business? How would I look for customers? How would I, you know, how would, how would it look? How would, what would my online presence be? You know, how would I share it, you know, socially? Um, that sort of thing. So maybe, maybe what it really is, is just uh, a practice owner saying, stepping back and saying, okay, if this were a startup, how would I do it? I wouldn't bring on a, you know, a staff with this much. I would grow into it. And, you know, outsourcing is a, is a, a an easy concept you know for guys like me but in dentistry there there isn't a lot of outsourcing or hasn't been a lot of outsourcing there are a lot of practice owners that you know in in my population of readers who have heard the term and you know they know that i don't know toyota outsources and ford outsources but um maybe take a second and just share those things i know insurance seems easy um accounts receivable might seem easy but it's things that they think, you know, the office manager will take care of that. And sometimes what happens is the office manager, you know, hires a friend and likes having, the, you know, they like being together, but it may not be the most efficient way to run your business. You may not be getting the best, you know, return on that dollar of, of cost, which is an employee, as you might get from, say, outsourcing. So can you share just maybe for, you know, uh, somebody who went to dental school and has heard the term, what exactly outsourcing means and is and how it factors into this? Yeah, what it's not is when you call Cam Comcast and you talk to George, who obviously is in India, right. and doesn't know how to communicate well with you and can't answer your question. That is not what right. dental outsourcing is. So this is having people with dental experience in the United States that are heavily trained and heavily audited and measured performing the work for your practice off-site. Okay. So, for example, patient calls your practice at 7 p.m. on a Friday, and you can't answer the phone. Someone in San Antonio answers the phone. They've had 40 hours of phone training. They know everything there is to know about your practice, and they schedule that patient into your schedule. Their bonus when their quality and their accuracy is high, and their bonus when the patient schedules the appointment. Or 2 p.m. on a Wednesday, you're open, and you have five phone calls come in, and your two people only answer two of them. The other three are saved by virtual schedulers, and you just get more patients that way. And for, for a startup, for example, 500 bucks a month or so, they get 92 hours a week of phone coverage by highly trained people, and the patients have no idea these people are in San Antonio. 500 bucks a month for 92 hours of coverage a week. That, and, and they can answer 20 calls at once if they had to. Mm -hmm. like you can't reproduce that productivity and that quality level in a traditional kind of old school way of staffing a practice. Right. That also exists with insurance verification, with processing EOBs, with resubmitting claims. And I'll tell you, the office manager sometimes isn't doing the work. We find embezzlement all the time. We find mistakes. We find three years of claims that weren't resubmitted. And now a bunch of them are past the statute of limitations. I mean, there's all kinds of things happening. But look, let's, let's back up a bit. What's the purpose of our day? The purpose is to treat the patient that's in the practice. Everything behind the scenes, in a way, gets in front of that. And it can hurt the patient experience. If we can outsource making collection calls, if we can outsource being on hold for 20 minutes as we verify insurance, 
right? If we can outsource the phone calls we can't seem to get to, all of those things enable us to focus on the patient in the office and get case acceptance and have an excellent experience for that patient. Now, outsourcing only works if the quality is good and the price is right. right. And today, with technology today, the quality is very good and the price is very low. And it wasn't that way just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So the new model says you outsource these types of things that are more affordable to outsource with better quality that get in the way of, of our patient experience. But in the practice, we are amazing at the patient experience. And that is a very lean model, the least dollar spent for the highest result possible. Right? And there, there's, there's several outsourcing firms out there. I mean, I mentioned ours, Front Desk TDS, but there's others as well. Um, and if, you're, if you've never used outsourcing, or, or, or you used it five years ago, you need to spend time and research this. Because I would not own dental practice myself without using outsourcing. It makes no financial sense to me to not have outsourcing. And if a dentist doesn't understand it, it means they're missing information or they have some sort of fear that, that additional knowledge would help them feel good about. Um, so you gotta look into it. So I, I think that's, and maybe one way to look at it is in a, in a, in a small solo practice, you're gonna have one person who's doing five jobs. You know, they're answering the phone and scheduling, they're doing the insurance filing, they're moving patients around, they're checking patients out, they're, you know, then they have to follow up on the insurance and you wonder why your AR, you have eight months of, of revenue in your AR. And outsourcing is just sort of, maybe think of it as a fractional employee. So I don't need a, I don't need a person just to sit here and answer the phone, I need a person to answer the phone when it rings. And collectively over the day, that's two hours worth of time. Um, and so outsourcing to somebody to answer the phones gets it answered then for a fraction of the cost of an employee. And I think a lot, of, a lot of practice owners don't even understand what an, you know, an employee costs a month. I mean, it's a few grand a month per an employee just to answer the phone once you factor in taxes and benefits and all that. And then you've got an insurance person, and if you're a certain size practice, you don't need a full-time insurance person. So you let your front desk person do it. And I think what you do is lose in outsourcing, they're one, that's all they do. That's what they know how to do. That's all they do. So they're going to be a lot more efficient at it and get it done. So it's a fractional person versus now one employee that you can see every day and, you know, who says hi and you talk about your kids. That is a very expensive very expensive in lost productivity, maybe, we'll say. So um, there are a lot of services. In fact, other than the clinical, I don't, is there anything you can't sort of hire an expert to do a fractional piece of to outsource, you know, just a part of that job? Yeah, in our, in our practices, when we outsource everything we can, um, the front desk person checks people in and checks people out and presents finances. And then outside of that, they are making sure that the lobby's in order, that people are supported, that things are clean, patients are happy. Um, but it's check-in, check-out, present finances. But see, there, there's, there's a cost aspect. It, we save money as a business when we do something like this. There's the uh, productivity aspect. Mm -hmm. we, we, can, we can have 20 calls answered at once with 20 fractional people that my one full-time person can never do, right? Um, and, and so that's a productivity and the consistent quality is a big deal mm -hmm. um, because the way outsourcing firms work is they have to ensure that all of their employees are meeting their own quality measurements, their own productivity measurements. They're recorded, they're audited, and, and you're not doing any of that for your people. So quality is really high. And I'll tell you, coming out of this crisis, none of us dentists can afford to miss a new patient phone call. Right. Period. We can't. So... At least, I mean, at least have your new patient calls that are missed routed to a virtual scheduler to save them. At least that, everyone should do that. And it's easy to do. When the patient calls, there's a way to tag them as a scheduling call. And if you miss that call in your practice, it can be saved by someone else. It's easy to set up. Technology sets it up this way. Everyone should do that because we cannot afford to miss the new patient call 
coming out of this crisis. So that's a, a, a good, so coming back stronger, you know, in the sort of the theme of what we're, we're talking about today, uh, to put a bow on it is utilize this time to figure out the technologies, figure out maybe ways of doing business that, you know, again, rather than just thinking, okay, we're going to get a notice, I'm going to get an email from the president that says, back to business and we just turn the key and you know we're back going look at those restructures maybe way to restructure your business for a year from now or two years from now um, versus just pick up where you left off yeah and I mentioned a whole lot of things right from yep. marketing to existing patients to payment options to phones outsourcing and you know um, just make this list get it done this is not a time to say oh I got the whole day off no work Work. Right. I mean, you're going to have to take care of your kids and you're now homeschooling, right? Right. Well, work. Now's the time to do this stuff. You know, you have the time. No excuses. Yeah. Work. So if you don't see, have patients to treat, go spend a day making decisions about your marketing, right? Like, work. Get it done because you are investing in your financial stability right now. Well, what a, what a good time to work on your business when you can't work in your business. So, um, well, good. Well, I see we're, we're uh, about at time and I, you know, I, this is a, um, this is a lot of information. Um, if anybody want to get in touch with you, just, re, you know, just, um, ask you a few questions or I, I think you said you'd be willing to open, open yourself up for that. How would they get in touch with you? Go to breakawayseminar.com and you could, you could shoot us a message there. Okay. Awesome. Any, um, as we wrap up here, we've covered a lot. Um, and this is a really tough time. And, and, you know, uh, uh, we talked beforehand about the practice owners. I see that, you know, every day it's a lot of just, um, desperation. Um, any parting thought you can give to somebody out there who is, who has that overwhelming stress and fear and anxiety, uh, trying to get through all this? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you know, I, I like to kind of say something all the time. It kind of brings me back to, to where I need to be, my foundation. Uh, because because I have lost and made millions. I've gone, I've broken my back even, right? I've been in millions of debt. I, I've gone through some pretty hard times myself. And, you know, sometimes the options out there seem overwhelming or the noise seems so loud, I'm almost deaf to what's important. Um, and you know, when I think about like, what's the right thing to do? If I, if I could just get that question, like what's the right thing to do? And when should we do the right thing? The answer is always right now. And I believe that we know for the most part, right things to do. We know we want to do them. The problem we have is we don't do, we don't do them right now. And, and so I, I believe that what holds a lot of us back is our ability to just do it now. And, you know, we're all different, obviously. People are all different. Uh, for me, the way that I'm able to do things right now is I work from a schedule. So if I make a list and say, God, I need to reevaluate my marketing plan. I need to figure out the phones. I need to go ahead and send an email out to all the patients. We need to update our Facebook. I make a list. I literally go to my calendar and I just put it in there. I'm going to get an hour for this, hour for that, hour for that. And I do it right now. And by being organized, it almost prevents the brain from just wandering around and looking at all the fears and, and being frozen of doing anything. We must find our personal way to be organized about it. And we must do it right now. Right now. Like, right now. If there's, we know the right thing to do. It must happen right now. No excuse. Do it now. That's the key thing in life, really. It's not even the knowledge that's key. We all know how to be healthy, right? Eat right, work out. We all know how to do it. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the knowledge. It's doing it. So find a system that gets you to do the 5, 10, or 20 things you know you need to do and do it right now. That is um, um, very wise words. I think, uh, again, I think you and I are a lot alike on that. My... Um, I'm a list guy. I start the day with the list and I need to see that list empty by the end of the day. So great advice. And um, I, again, I see we're up at time. I uh, wish, I think we could talk for hours. And I think a lot of practice owners 
um, would love to hear a lot more. And I think you'll be, you'll be surprised at the number that reach out, which um, I'd like to end with that, um, you know, that word of advice to practice owners who are struggling right now. There's a, I can sense the stress in the emails that I get, the phone calls and the text. Um, reach out, do exactly what you're doing right now. Look at ways to, to see your practice coming back. Look forward, look to the future. Don't look at CNN, you know, turn that off. And I always say, you know, I, I always remember back when, you know, when I was young, we got the newspaper at the end of the day, you know, we get home uh, or the morning and we'd see the news at six o'clock and find out what happened. Um, find a time just to turn it off. Not the, the you know, the virus isn't gonna be cured and, and, and business open up between, you know, six o'clock tonight and nine o'clock you know, tomorrow morning. Turn it off and you know you know somebody will let you know when something like that happens so but reach out um don't do this yourself reach out to somebody like dr luna reach out to us uh reach out to uh, somebody in you know your study club um wherever you live but um if you feel that pressure just reach out share it. we're all going through the same thing practice owners are all going through the same thing in some form or fashion so uh just reach out so um Dr. Luna, thanks for coming on this morning. Looks like wonderful weather in San Antonio. Yeah, it's getting there. It's getting there. <laughs> lots, lots of walking. Uh, that's like date night is uh, let's walk around the block. <laughs> so, right. I can see outside here. I used to see one or two people once in a while. Now it's all day long, you know, couples out walking up and down the street. So um, maybe that good comes out of all this. Yep, yep. Well, thank you for having me. I, I, uh, I do wish everyone the best of luck in acting and, and moving forward and just getting something done, you know it got to get done. Thank you so much. Thank you for being on. And uh, practice owners, we'll see you next time.